Hello and welcome to season five, Anna Cusack here. This episode is a conversation between myself and Newcastle-based postpartum doula, Sarah Allen. She joins me to kick off this season, which asks the question, how do those involved in pregnancy, birth and postnatal care prepare when they are the ones having the baby? This theme has come about because if you didn't know already, I'm actually in my second trimester with my second child. And I wanted to share not only my story and expertise, but the combined knowledge and plans of others who work in this space to show you there's more than one way to get your needs met during the perinatal period, which is the time through kind of the fertility and conception journey right through to early postpartum and infancy. If you want to know from personal and professional experience how to set yourself up for a supported postpartum, this episode is for you. We look at practical and emotional support, who can provide what at different times and what kind of spanners can get thrown in the works too. We also discuss changing family dynamics and the evolutions of the role and identity of mother as more children join the family. The episodes in this series will be brought to you every two or three weeks over the coming months. I don't know about you, but I sometimes feel under pressure to keep up with weekly episodes, even from my favourite podcasters, so I'm going to take the pressure off you listening and me editing and space these ones out, particularly as many of them will have actionable steps and we might need time to actually get in and do them. I know also my capacity has been stretched lately and as such I'm not taking any more in-home postpartum support clients for the remainder of my pregnancy. My online services though for things like postpartum planning, transition to motherhood sessions and those kind of what am I doing with my life or career conversations will still be available though and as always they are on a by donation basis rather than a set fee. I think that's all I wanted to tell you about so let's get in and hear what Sarah has to say. This interview was conducted during her second trimester and she is expecting her third baby a girl after two boys. Enjoy! Hello and welcome to this episode of the Anna Asks podcast. I am your host, Anna Cusack, and today I am joined in conversation with Sarah Allen. Now, we are both postpartum doulas. We actually only live about 10 minutes apart, both here, Lake Macquarie area, beautiful Awabakal country, and we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander or First Nations people who are listening here. This episode is part of our special series on what is it like to prepare for a baby yourself when your work is focused on preparing others for that experience. So Sarah, welcome. Thank you. I'd love for you to give yourself a bit of an introduction, please. So we've covered where you are, but perhaps who you are, who's in your family and and what's really brought on your drive and desire to do the work that you do? Oh, that is a big, big question. As you mentioned, I am a postpartum doula in the same area as you. I am a mother to two very full-on boys and soon to be a mum to a little girl, which hopefully will be a little bit of a calming influence in the household, although I'm doubtful. (laughs) Um, Yeah, you never can be quite sure how that's going to play out. No, no. And I've, I've seen how much my boys kind of feed off each other. So I, I really do think that she's just going to end up being a wild child too, but that's okay. All the spirited children live in my house, it seems. (laughs) The biggest thing for me becoming a postpartum doula was my experience with my first son and just the complete, I want to say unraveling of of who I thought I was, but I mean that in the best possible way. I just had, you know, I had a corporate career I that I tied my identity to completely. And then having that 12 months off and questioning so much about who I was really made me look for something that was going to feed my soul as much as motherhood did because I felt like you know obviously to keep our family above water I I need to work but I hated the idea of being away from my child just to earn money so I 
you started this big quest on, you know, what am I passionate about? What's going to really, really drive me? And my postpartum experience with Sid, my eldest, was really, really hard and a lot harder than I thought it would be. And when I came across the magical title of postpartum doula, I I just dived wholeheartedly in and yeah, I, don't, I just don't think that there's ever been anything in my life that I've been so passionate about that has been so transformative for me as well. Yeah, a beautiful story. And one that I hear a lot, a lot of people do come to this kind of work after having a really difficult first experience and being completely broken down and rebuilt within that context of of matrescence and the ways that that is harder in a society that really doesn't value the the role of mother or the work of mothering and trying to find yeah yourself and and what your passions may be in this totally new phase of your life and and incarnation of your identity yes absolutely and i think for me learning about what matrescence was was it like completely mind-blowing because that was i was able to fully identify with that before i knew what matrescence was i felt like i felt like i was alone almost in going through this huge identity shift I, you know i have I'm very, very blessed that I have lots of beautiful women around me that have all gone through motherhood prior to me and I certainly didn't feel like they were experiencing the shift as deeply as what I was. So once I discovered what matrescence was and, you know, just learning that we all experience it so differently was so settling for me and really reassuring that, you know, we do all experience it so differently in saying that I am so, so grateful that my experience was earth shattering because I do not at all identify with who I was before I was a mum. You know, there's obviously parts of me that I do, but as a whole, I just, yeah, she's a totally different person in the, in the best possible way. I needed to be who I was to become who I am now. And I, I love that. So do I. That explanation rings very true for me. Now, we're both in our second trimester at the moment. I'm pregnant with my second child. You are pregnant with your third. So as somebody who is that extra step ahead of me, I wanted to ask you that process of matrescence, the process of dissolving and becoming a new butterfly as a mother, How did that process play out differently second time around? Did it happen all over again or was it not to the same intensity perhaps? I just got goosebumps how you were explaining it is that the process of a butterfly, that is just the most eloquent way that I've heard it described. I I think um, maybe it's Dr. Oscar Serilak who talks about it as the mother morphosis instead of the metamorphosis of the butterfly. Oh, God. That is just so, it's just so beautiful. I've like got goosebumps on my face. (laughs) I think for me, I think because the process the first time around was so big, I, I was really prepared for it to be exactly the same the second time around. And it, it wasn't in the early days. I, I felt so settled and so, I don't want to say confident because I, you know, I certainly wasn't, you know, walking around thinking that I knew everything, but I, I think I was really settled in that it was okay for me to not know how to do everything. And I knew where to go for support. I'm finding that now. So Aubrey, my second is he'll be three in a couple of months. I'm finding that now is actually when I'm, I'm having more of a challenge because as, as you naturally do, you know, I'm comparing my experience with my first to my second and the age that Aubrey's at, Sid already had a younger sibling and, you know, my, my time was already, you know, juggled between the two of them. 
and they are just such different personalities. So I feel like in the early, like newborn days, probably up until the age that he was about two, I I was really, really settled and calm in how I responded to things. But now that his personality is well and truly shining through and it is polar opposite to his brother, I think now's now is when I'm more experiencing matrescence than anything else because he's pushing me to grow all over again as a mum that, yeah, that Sid just didn't. I mean, Sid obviously has continued to push me every day of his life because, you know, with every new day for him as a child, it's a new day for me as a mum of a child that age. But, yeah, it's like the confidence that I build with him, Aubrey is kind of shattering and <laughs> making me rebuild and I mean that in the in the best possible way <laughs> yeah because you almost have to become a separate mother for separate children and I was speaking with Absolutely. a friend who is a mum of three recently her youngest is three or four years old and the others I think are about around seven and nine and we were just talking about how when all those children need something different from her it's almost like she's having to put on like the little kid mum mask and then the big kid <laughs> mask and the the difficulty and the frustration or snappiness might come out when it's like there's not time to change to change the way that you're relating to each child before you respond to the one that needs you at that exact moment. And I can already feel myself thinking through like, oh, how am I going to do this with two? I really don't know that I could that I could contemplate adding a third to the mix. And the second hasn't even arrived, like the way that we project these things. So it's really interesting to hear that it's kind of this matrescence period is reoccurring and will continue to recur while your second son is at the age he's at simultaneous to when this third baby is approaching entering your family as well. Yes, absolutely. And I think, you know, I certainly, I had very different challenges after I'd had Aubrey than what I did with Sid. But like I said previously, I I had the knowledge and the confidence to ask the right people for support. So I didn't find that as challenging as what I did the second time. But yeah, Sid is, um, he's a very, very gentle natured child and you know, he's quite, um, he doesn't need a lot of encouragement to do things, but, you know, he's very cuddly. He's very, very warm and affectionate. And I can't leave the house without, you know, fully explaining to him where I'm going and why. Whereas Aubrey is just, he's just full of this fire and this passion and, it's like he's just got so much spirit. It's like the world revolves around him. So he doesn't, he's not as impacted by those sorts of things. So it's it's definitely, um, as your friend said, like you, you parent them differently. Overall, I think obviously your morals and your family values and things like that are the same. But, <clears throat> excuse me, the way the way that they need you to show up for them is, completely different you know I yeah you're in relationship with them it's the same as you might have two best friends but the way that you relate to each of those people is different absolutely absolutely I you know I was actually saying this to a girlfriend this morning I feel like Sydney came to me as my child to teach me to have the confidence to advocate for him um, and that is something that, you know, I've well and truly learned over the last five years. And with Aubrey, I feel like he's going to be the one that, you know, as both of my boys start schooling and then, you know, Sid starts next year, Aubrey will start a couple of years after that. I feel like he's almost the one that's going to be Sid's confidence in that environment where, you know, parents aren't going to be around. So, yeah, I always I always find like the you know, the family dynamic and I'm so interesting and I'm so intrigued to see what this little one's going to bring to the table and how she's going to complete our family. Like you were saying about 
you know, you can't contemplate it a third whilst you're trying to grasp a second. My husband was very, very similar. I have always said that I wanted three. So, you know, the conversations around when we were deciding to have a third were quite, quite heavy. And I just kept saying to him, we're not done. There's somebody else that's, you know, there's another energy that needs to be in this family. And that was just such a, a pull for me. And, and yeah, now that it's happening, I'm like, oh, what is it? What is she going to bring? And I'm, yeah, very excited to find out. <laughs> oh, I'm so excited for you. I'm going to move on to our next question because I think we could just go around on this part for an eternity. Um, yes. <laughs> so you've obviously learnt things through first and second babies. How are you doing things differently this time around compared to previous times? So across your pregnancy, birth, postpartum kind of planning, what is the same or, or different to before? Yeah, you can go as vague or as nitty gritty as you like. Let's dive into all the detail. <laughs> With Sid, I I thought I had all the support that I needed in terms of, like I mentioned before, I had quite a few girlfriends that have all had all become mums um, recently or, you know, around the same time that, that I was. So I, you know, I was one of those bullheaded mums that was like, I don't need a mum's group. I've already got my friends. So I know my mum's group, I, I've got one for each of my boys and they are my lifeline. <laughs> so don't be like me. But yeah, I thought I had all the support in the world with Sid. Um, my mum and I are really close. So, you know, we also have a relationship where I can tell her what I need when I need it. And I, you know, I don't have to, sugarcoat anything and she's you know quite understanding of you know if I'm abrupt or you know not as polite as I normally am you know she has the capacity to to cope with that but what I didn't anticipate was life happening and my mum actually ended up she had shingles and she was really quite sick for quite a few months and that completely wiped her out of being able to support me and it really played a huge impact on my postpartum because that left everything to my husband he had to be the one that you know pushed me to go and see a lactation consultant when I, I needed one and a women's health physio when I needed one because I was just in this it'll be right you know it's about the baby it's not about me and yeah it was it was a lot for the two of us to take on and I also I didn't at the time I didn't feel like I could talk to all of my friends that had just become mums about what I was going through because I just kept thinking well they've got their own stuff going on they don't want to be helping me they need to be helping themselves so yeah that support I thought I had didn't work out the same way the wall the way that I thought it would so then when I had Aubrey I was really purposeful about how I wanted to be supported. Uh, obviously, thankfully, my mum was healthy by then and able to pitch in a lot more. But I also, you know, I had a little list on my fridge of what people could do when they came over to visit. And I wasn't, I wasn't backward in coming forward about how people could support me. Whereas first time around, I was very much like, I'm okay, I'm okay, no one needs to help me. And I was trying to be a bit more of a martyr, whereas second time around, I, I wasn't like that at all. I was very upfront with the support that I needed. And my birth also went a lot better than my birth did with Sid, which made a huge difference because my recovery was a lot better. But I, again, wasn't backwards in comings forward about asking for help the moment that I knew I needed it instead of hoping it would just figure itself out. And I think this time around, I'm not just relying on my own village, you know, my, my own family and friends for support. A lot of my girlfriends that all had their babies when, you know, I was having Sid and Aubrey, they've all completed their families now. So I don't have that, you know, close friend network like I did. 
but also being in the jobs that we're in, I'm so much more aware of the impact that having someone that's not emotionally connected to your life in every other way, I know the benefit of having that kind of support. So I'm really excited to, you know, have someone that I can just completely unload to when I need to. And that goes for both birth and postpartum. I didn't have a doula for either of my first two births. And, you know, looking back, I don't, I don't really feel like I needed one, but I will have one this time. Um, and I'm quite looking forward to having that other energy in the room and Dean, my husband, being able to fully dive in on like emotionally supporting me. Whereas, you know, the other two, my other two births, he was, he was doing everything in terms of physical support that I needed and, and emotional support. So I'm kind of, yeah, I'm really looking forward to the fact that he can just dial in on emotionally supporting me during the birth and all the physical stuff being done by, you know, someone else. And, and the same goes for my postpartum care, really. I'm looking forward, you know, to the similar sort of thing, but also allowing him the space to connect with our next bub and not having to stress so much about keeping a house running and also to have the time and capacity to help our boys with a transition because they're both you know obviously so much older um Sid was only two when I had Aubrey and I don't really like he he took it the transition beautifully I don't really think he was impacted by it at all but you know now he's five and Aubrey will be three so they are, you know, both obviously that much older and I'm prepared that that transition will be a lot harder for both of them because they're so much more aware of my time capacity. So, yeah, having that support, outside support from other people is yeah going to be completely invaluable because it means Dean and I can focus on what's genuinely important to our family and that's connection and, you know, doing this transition as smoothly as possible even though I'm so aware it's not going to be smooth <laughs> you know there might be smooth little blips there but um it could <laughs> no it, it could just be it could just be smooth sailing you don't know you know you have amassed a wonderful support team there you've mentioned that you've previously mm -hmm. used lactation consultants women's health physios you uh, looking at doula and professional support, birth and postpartum. You have your close family. You have those friends who they may have completed their families. So you may not have that age matched baby, but in some ways having them a step removed can actually be helpful at that time as well. So you might be surprised, you know. Absolutely. And I think you know, I have, my two sister-in-laws have both had babies in the last couple of years and it has killed me <laughs> slowly that I'm still in the trenches so much with my boys that I haven't been able to fully support them the way that they supported me, especially with, with Sid, with my first. And, and even with Aubrey, really, because the first of my nephews was born a year after so you know I had that that support and they had that you know mental and emotional capacity to support me so yeah I am quite excited that you know a lot of my my close friends have moved out of that phase so they they do have that mental and emotional capacity a little bit more and I think as you move out of the newborn and the toddler phases uh, hormones do that amazing thing where they start to romanticize that time so when you know you look back on it you're like oh it was just so beautiful and it was so lovely and then when you've got you know a close friend that's in it and you can physically see the not the strain but you know just the emotions on their face and them trying to hold it together and you know pull together a smile or you know the exhaustion that they're going through 
it is one of those, you know, it pulls you right back to the actual reality of it. I get to see that on a day-to-day basis with the mums that I work with. So it's it's been really nice for me to have that reminder of, okay, yeah, this isn't just all beautiful and romantic and don't just get like a little doll that I get to, you know, look after all the time and just cuddle. Like there is a reality towards, like behind all of this. So, yeah, I am looking forward to having that, I guess having the support from my close friends that I thought I would have with my first that, you know, I didn't feel like I had because they were so busy with their own, whereas this time around they won't be in the trenches with me. They're still in the trenches of motherhood, absolutely. But, yeah, they're not in the the newborn trenches. And for them, I know that, you know, coming to visit me will be a solace almost because, you know, we all know that a newborn doesn't talk back and (laughs) doesn't have temper tantrums and... And also it's just so much easier at times to have multiple children aged two to six in the same house with a couple of adults than it is to just have your own kids with just you at home. The support kind of looks different in that just having their presence there with their kids means that you're not juggling the older ones with the baby at the same time. Absolutely. Absolutely. One of the things that I had, I mentioned my little list that was on the fridge earlier. One of the things that I had on there was to walk my dog because, you know, it's one of the the things that we just did not have the capacity to do. And one of my girlfriends said to me not that long ago, oh, that's a great idea. When, when you, when I come over to visit or, you know, my, my two best friends, I'm like, when we come over to visit, we'll take the dog for a walk. And I was like, no, you won't you will stay in my house and you will help me and your children will play with my children. My dad can come over and walk my dog. My brother can go and take my dog for a walk. Or if you're coming over on a day that my husband's home, he can go and take the dog for a walk because I'm not going to need that physical kind of support from them. I'm going to need that emotional support. I'm going to need them to hold me in a way that only other mothers can. And also, you know, our kids know each other so well. They know our houses so well that, you know, even if I'm leaving the house and going to their house, it's like going to another home that you're comfortable in. And it does make mothering so much easier when your children have other mothers around them that they know and they trust and they feel just as comfortable with as they feel with, you know, any other family member that you've got that they you know, have a relationship with. Yeah, absolutely. There was one other thing that you mentioned earlier that I wanted to touch on with you, which was that feeling of almost guilt, that it's hard when you have your own baby to not be able to give as much to the people who gave to you when you have perhaps that, I don't know, perhaps first, second, third child, and then the friend who's been helping you or sister or sister-in-law, whoever it is, has their own child and just sheer logistics because of the work that you're putting in, the constant runny noses of toddlerhood, all of those things mean that you actually can't be that useful to them in return. And for me, when I think about this, this is part of the reason that we need to be inviting people who don't have children into our space because that sets the precedent then for them to do the same thing when it's their turn and it's initiating the next round of mothers not the next generation i'm talking like the next three years worth of people who are going to become mothers as to what this period actually looks like because you know we're so separated that often the first baby that someone holds or actually has an active caring role for is their own so unless we are seeking those people out, inviting them in, asking for their assistance, they're going to go in completely blind and be floundering around exactly the same as you described that first with your first postpartum, Sarah, of going, oh no, it'll be fine. We're just managing on our own. Like this is part of opening up the reality of motherhood and the conversation of what these things are like. So they can make, they can make the choice if it's something that they want to do for a start and to see that getting help 
and support is the way it's meant to be. That's my thought anyway. There's my little sermon finished. Absolutely. One of my girlfriends had had her children five, seven, seven and five years before I became a mum. And I still apologise for how horrendously I supported her in that time. She actually lived down the road from where I worked. So I would go and have lunch with her on my lunch breaks, but she would make me lunch. And I'm saying that so that everybody can see you can change. You know, I I would never in a blue moon do, do that now. But that's what I, I thought that, you know, going in and just being there with her and holding her baby for her was enough. And there are certainly Which maybe that, that is what you know, she wanted, but it probably yeah, wasn't what she wanted every day. Yeah, but it's like, you know, I was also a, I also could have done that, but I also could have brought lunch with me and removed, you know, another burden and not left you with the washing up. Like it's all those tiny little things, but I had zero concept of what it was like to be a mum. You know, I genuinely thought that you just kind of sat around and cuddled a baby. I rem- I remember distinctly being pregnant with Sid and saying to my boss at work, oh, I'm, I'm going to take 12 months off, you know, because that's that was what, you know, I was allowed. But I'm probably going to get really bored and I'll probably want to come back after like three or six months. And that was because from, you know, my own mum and people of her generation, that's what I'd heard, you know, that, oh, it can get really boring and you're a smart girl, you're going to need the, the mental challenge of going back to work. And I was not that at all, at all. I didn't, I didn't want to step foot back into that office ever again in my life. I did to see if I could do it. And, you know, I went back to work for 12 months before I then had Aubrey and I hated every day of it. I loved my job. I loved the people I worked with, but didn't fulfill any part of me at all being there but yeah going back to the you know supporting new mums before you're a mum yourself one of my sister-in-laws wasn't a mum when I had Sid she's only just become a mum in the last 12 months and she still says the same thing to me you know like I could have supported you so much better if I had any understanding so I think it is that you know as a society like you said we really do need to be inviting you know women maidens as you will call them into that space so they can they can see the reality of it but the other side of that is that as a new mum you also it's that weird guilt that you you don't want to talk about the reality of how hard it is because you feel like someone that hasn't experienced it firsthand might take that as you being ungrateful and that is so far from the actual truth as well yeah and that's a whole extra conversation that we could have about breaking down breaking down the ideas that we either have to be ungrateful or fulfilled and and there's nothing in between that even the concept of like a good day and a bad day or a a good night and a bad night you know there's going to be some bits of everything that are always good and some bits that are always bad it just depends what ratio it's in at that exact moment or that exact period and they shift and change so before we wrap this up I have two final questions for you one of them is is there anything that you are doing or resources that you are calling on this time around that perhaps listeners might not have heard of before or considered prioritizing the biggest thing for me is that I have spent intentional time really intentional time planning my postpartum and not just you know with Aubrey I had already studied to be a postpartum doula so I felt like I'd enacted a lot of what I had learned but this time I've sat down and taken the time to put things in writing so that the people around me can pick up without me having to direct them. For example, 
I have a list and, you know, you would have the same, you know, as a postpartum doula, you have a list of all the local professionals that are around you that can support a new mum in a myriad of ways. So obviously that's, you know, a very easy thing for me to have on hand. I've been building that over the last few years, but I, I will have that, you know, printed and available for other people to see because I know that when I'm sleep deprived, when I'm in the thick of it, I'm not going to have the capacity to see that I potentially need help and having that, you know, the professional support list printed, you know, my husband who is clearly not in the, you know, postpartum doula space as much as he probably knows a lot more than people who aren't married to a postpartum doula, he's still not living it, you know, day to day like I am, but he can browse through it and, you know, see the myriad of different types of support that I can have. And he could say to me, you know, I can see that you're really depleted right now. Why don't you, you know, go and see a naturopath or do you think it might be a good idea to go and talk to a counsellor? And then I have that there and I have that ready to go. And the other side of that is that I have a list of, you know, jobs around the house that if someone is asking me, you know, oh, what can I do to help you? Your instant reaction is, oh, nothing. And then they walk out the door and you're like, oh, actually they really could have like wiped down the bathrooms or they really could have like dusted that shelf that's been driving me crazy for weeks. Little things like that that you just remove that mental load from you that's it so you can just give them give them the answer oh yeah. I don't even know there's a list on the fridge could you check that yes and they go yeah yes. okay sure it's like oh yeah I can unstack the dishwasher <laughs> if I don't know where some things go they'll stay on the bench but yeah I can I can do that yes precisely and it's the other part of it that I'm really focusing on and it's something that I really encourage all the mums that I work with is to write down your oxytocin boosters. So, you know, the beautiful thing about being human is that we're all so different. So, you know, all the things that make us, you know, happy and, you know, give us that little boost of love during the day. You know, for me, it's sitting out, you know, it's a beautiful sunny day today, which is quite bizarre, but sitting out in the sunshine or, you know, drinking a cup of tea whilst it's hot, you know, all those small little things that bring you little glimpses of joy I actually have a list of all of them written down and I will be saying to everybody that comes to my house if you're here like I would love for you to do one task for me around the house that gives me the capacity to then do one thing on my list that's going to fill my cup that's going to make me feel like your visit has properly filled me instead of potentially draining me so that's you know everyone that visits um I think it's Dr Oscar Sellerelak that says you know there should be no guests only only staff I think is what he said that's probably a terrible quote but um I've got that probably got that totally wrong but I I fully intend on using that you know everyone that comes will be doing a simple job around the house I mean I'm not going to make anybody clean my house from top to bottom but you know there's some people I'll trust to clean my toilet you know some people I know I know well enough that that won't irk them so yeah there will be some people that I will trust to do do more you know intimate things for us around the home but at the same time even if all they're doing when they're coming over is making me a cup of tea that's enough too as long as when they leave I feel nourished and supported instead of depleted then yeah so long as you feel replenished in some way rather than being attacked by an energy vampire then you're on the right track yes so if anyone you've given us so much so much to work on from your experience and and the wisdom you've shared here but if there is anyone listening or wanting their experiences to be different from the last time they had a baby or perhaps different to the norm that they see around them is there a final nugget of advice that you would give them 
I would say unpack what it is that didn't work last time because you can put all of the positive support in place but if, if there is something that was a really negative experience for you previously or that you've seen if you're a first-time mum if you've seen others go through it and you want to avoid that fully understand that and understand why it happened because if you're just putting a whole heap of things in place to hope to avoid it it may still happen whereas if you're fully aware and educated on why it happened and you know how it happened then I think you've got a whole heap more knowledge to make sure it doesn't happen again Yeah. And sometimes that can be structural in that your mum being your primary support first time around got ill and you go, okay, well, I do need to expand and Mm -hmm. think that I have to be more flexible with my plan. And for some people, it's actually going to take a bit more soul searching and digging than that, because you can have all of the things, all of the people lined up to love on you. But if you have a wound about being unworthy of receiving that love there's gonna you're gonna be putting up blocks to having that help and that love poured on you during that period even if it's something that you really want and would benefit from so it's not always not always the easiest fix absolutely and I think that is that is motherhood in a nutshell there you know there's a hierarchy of lots of easy fixes and then there's you know the fixes that you'll be working through your entire life but I think in in terms of specific postpartum if you know and understand where they you know where they come from or you know like you mentioned about you know you wanting help but there's something in you that stops that you know your ego is stopping that if you're having conversations with those you love about your fears around that and saying, you know, like, I know I can be really bad with accepting help. In the moment, having somebody say to you, you know, do you really want help or because you're putting up some boundaries, having someone that you love and trust to be able to point out what you're actually expressing to other people, whether you're meaning to or not, is really, really vital. So, you know, with a lot of, you know, the big heavy things, it's not just on you to process them. You, you know, you have a partner and you have a support network that you should rely on to help you get through all of them. Because, you know, often when you're sleep deprived, when you're just trying to survive through the day, you just do those knee jerk reactions and don't think about them. You know, you just act how you've always acted. But if you you're relying on your support network to push you through those things in a loving way, obviously, then it's going to make it a whole lot easier too. So, you know, really involving everyone in you growing as a mum. And it is, it's a really beautiful thing too. It's hard, but it's beautiful. So beautiful. We're going to leave it there for today. Thank you so much for your time, Sarah. And Thank good you. luck in the second half of your pregnancy and and for the birth of your beautiful baby girl and for becoming a family of five. Yeah, that sounds so strange when you say it like that. I don't think I've had anyone say that to me yet. So that's, wow, mm. that's a lot. The completion. <laughs> the, the completion. completion. Absolutely the completion. Thank you. this episode of Anna Asks it would be a great help if you pop across and leave us a five-star rating or review this helps other parents and people to find us and join in the conversation you can also become a sponsor of this pod for $2.99 Australian a month via the link in the show notes or head to my website www.annacusack.com.au to grab my free postpartum preparation e-guide check out my services or grab my book Until next episode, bye from me. Unless, of course, you want to come chat via socials at Anna Cusack Postpartum before then. See you soon.